Hello, and welcome to another fully live news episode of Hacking with Friends. My name is Cody Kinsey. I am a security researcher at Veronis, and today, no Killian. I don't, I don't know where he is. I'm assuming Killian's busy somewhere, maybe on vacation. I don't know. But either way, I figured I would do the stream myself since I didn't hear back earlier. And uh, yeah, uh, we're going to do it with a lot of things to discuss. So hopefully we've got a good audience today because, uh, yeah, there's some real interesting stories about Meta spying on customers and uh, actually being charged, uh, oh, accused of violating the wiretapping act, which is a pretty big deal. So this is something that is currently in litigation. It's something that came out in the news today, and we're going to talk about that and more. Uh, yeah. So, all right. Uh, hello, Mojo1854 as well. Uh, I uh, Can you tell me about API pen testing? Uh, well, maybe. We're going to talk about the news today, but some of it does involve um, APIs and also VPNs uh, and endpoint uh, pen testing. So let's go ahead and get started. So um, one of the things that happened this week was also about developing some of my own tools. So this is a little, let me enlarge my code here. This is a scrappy little circuit Python program that I wrote uh, in order to use this little device I'm holding right here. Let me, oops, now the screen's in the way. Uh, there we go. Uh, this little long range device right here to act as a long range bad USB device. So I plug this in or you know, a future generation of this, it's a little smaller. Uh, and then from a really long distance, I would be able to use a second device to trigger it and cause a bad USB attack. So I wanted to see how hard that would be in CircuitPython since it's a beginner friendly language and a lot of people have learned to control hardware uh, via CircuitPython just for ease of use, you know? And so for somebody who likes to make prototypes for other beginners, I decided to make this quick and dirty, very gross. Uh, oh yeah, you can tell that a prototype is is uh, quick and dirty when I leave the default. Write your code here uh, in from Moo Editor. But this is 120 lines and basically what it does is it allows me to plug this device in, listen for AT messages, which are messages sent by this little LoRa receiver that I have plugged in. And um, after that, it's just a little bit of wiring. So uh, I was pretty impressed by how quickly I managed to get this working. Uh, I'm not going to do a demo today just because uh, it turns out if I plug both of uh, these devices into the same computer, they freak out. And uh, I haven't had a chance to actually debug that part. But if they're plugged into different computers, then I can send a signal from one to trigger the other to run any bad USB payload. And basically, the default that is provided by um, uh, CircuitPython is this library called Adafruit Ducky. So I didn't know that this existed, but <clears throat> If you have a really um, like simple microcontroller that supports native USB, like an ESP32S2 or a Raspberry Pi Pico, you can actually use CircuitPython to do some pretty sophisticated bad USB things. Now, the one thing that I don't like about this that I uh, at a glance wasn't able to solve is I don't think that you can set the VID and PID, which is essential for some of these attacks, where basically you can set the vendor and product identification and make the uh, device you're plugging in mimic a specific keyboard. Um, so I wasn't really able to get that part working, but for the very basics of making your own keyboard device, a lot of people will use just the Adafruit, like USB HID library to make their own keyboard so they can like wire up their own keyboard. That's super cool. Uh, but if you wanted to run ducky scripts, there is actually an official Adafruit library that is included, uh, in their like Adafruit bundle where you can import a regular ducky script and run it. Now, I'm not sure how hack five people feel about this. I, I don't. No, don't really think they were consulted, seeing as this is just an open source commit on an open source project. But it is interesting and cool to see that there is some uh, support. And basically, this is all you need to do in order to set up this uh, ducky script thing. So uh, at a certain point, then you just call the uh, do ducky script function, which I, I wrote myself. Uh, and it, it basically just runs all the code in the ducky script. So for making something that is really, really small, uh, and easy to use as a bad USB device. I thought this was cool, but my first thought is, why don't I strap a LoRa module onto this and stretch it so it can go really, really far and it doesn't rely on any other sort of data connection. So I'm gonna be working on this more. You can expect a video on this, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, yeah, like these uh, cool hardware things I've been mashing together. As a kid, I was very much into Legos. And to me, this is just adult Legos where you take like a component that you think is cool that does something interesting, you mash it onto another like microcontroller, and the whole thing ends up costing like less than, you know, like $20. Like that's pretty exciting to me. 
So uh, yeah, that's one of the things I've been working on. I was a little inspired by my conversation with Joe earlier. And if you didn't catch it, we had our very first incident of the month. So that means we got to have the Veronis Threat Labs team come on and basically get clearance to talk about some of the really interesting attacks that they're seeing uh, being in the thick of it and doing some interesting work, not just also defensive work, but also adversary simulation. So taking the kinds of things that they see attackers doing and then making their own custom tools to basically emulate that and offering that as a service to basically find out if customers could stand up to that sort of attack. So we were bonding over how we both also like to make you know, our own tools and like make hacking stuff and how we both also like strapping those tools to drones and flying them around. So if you didn't catch uh, that video, you should check it out. I know that we're going to do some cutouts of it, but talking to an incident response analyst and the head of forensics um, in a team that works on a lot of this sort of stuff was really, really cool. Like we learned a lot and we're gonna have him back on once a month to talk about the incident of the month, but also maybe some cool adversary and drone hacking and like other things that uh, our audience is interested in. So really cool to have him on the show and uh, hopefully you guys like that stream because it was one of my favorites that we've done in a while. Um, uh, uh, I used to watch your videos since I was a kid, and now because of you, I'm learning uh, BSC and cybersecurity. Uh, thanks very much, man. Keep growing. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, it's funny. I actually talked to um, some of the people who purchased the Nullbyte channel earlier today, and we were trying to figure out if I could do some content on there again. Um, and it was honestly like you know similar to the same story that, that I had when I first started the channel, where they're like, hey, like you could do this, but we don't have much of a budget for it, and like you know, it's you're basically gonna get some exposure and like, you know, as be, being a content creator and then before that, a photographer, I've had people offering me exposure, you know, in, in lieu of compensation for like a very long time. And because so many of you recognize us, you value the new content content that we're creating and the ideas that we've had and also the community that we built up. Um, I was just like, I don't think, you know, you know we'll, we'll see, we'll see. But like, I would rather make content here and make sure that everybody who's involved is like paid well, that like, we can basically focus on making really great content and feel connected to it rather than getting like the same like flat rate for every video. Like one of my biggest complaints about making content back when I did Nullbyte was like we got paid the same amount of money when we made a video that made a million views that took like all week for us to make. Or like if we just made a quick video like all fast that like got like 500 views like over the course of years. So because like the people we were originally working with didn't really understand what we were trying to do and they didn't really want us to do great work. They just wanted us to do a lot of work. Um, that was something that I learned later on, like prevented us from doing some of our best work. And some of our best work was we went on to the Hack 5 channel. And then the number two video of all time on Hack 5 is my friend Nick just talking about Google dorks. So anyway, a lot of lessons learned. And it's really cool to have people still recognize uh, our old channel. Ah, uh, yes, hello. Uh, and just grow with us. So yep, we are over here now. Uh, you'll notice the stream is on a couple channels, actually. Uh, we have the Verona's LinkedIn channel. We have uh, the radio channel. We have Security Forward. Uh, so we're syndicating it all over the place because uh, we like to connect with our community. And it's really cool to run into people that like saw my show forever ago and now are doing their own cool cyber stuff. Like, hopefully, you know, someday you could be on the show. Like, tell us about something cool that you're doing. Um, anyway, anyway, we, gotta, we still have a lot of news. Uh, but that that is kind of what I was working on this week. Just more cool Laura stuff. And um, so... Obviously, I am a bit of a maker. Like I enjoy like connecting things together, like I said, like Lego pieces and building demos. So sometimes I'm talking about all this like spooky cyber stuff and people just like don't know what I'm talking about. You know, like I need to make it visual. And as someone with ADD, I often need things to be physical. So one of the th uh, teaching tools that I have been working on making with friends is this like cool little breadboard breakout um that is designed to make it easier for me to teach people electronics like at workshops like all this other stuff like we we love doing that so i worked with my friend aria on some upgrades and i was like man i wish i could do just like i2c sensors so i could like buy these things off aliexpress and just connect them and like plug them in and do a class where people just learn to program and if not so much about you know breadboarding and like oh you have an off by one error it's only so valuable uh, you know, to, to learn that like you put the wire in the wrong place at a certain point if what you're trying to learn is like uh, programming or prototyping. So, you know, like I asked my friend to make some updates and now um, based on those updates, I got this new thing back and we're going to release these files um, eventually. We're experimenting with them still. I feel uncomfortable releasing files like while um, <laughs> it could still start a fire. Uh, so, you know, we're doing some testing, 
but basically the idea here is like that I can plug in this big NeoPixel grid. Uh, you can't really see the JSD connector, but it's on the other side of this little breadboard. And you can plug in I2C sensors and you can even chain them in a big chain and teach classes like super easily. So when we go to workshops or like when we um, have booths at conferences, we'll often like kind of like give these away or like uh, other, because they're relatively cheap to to like make and they really make it easier for you to, you know, try out your sensors or, or add, uh, we had a big uh, display of Pusheens at our booth at scale, and we controlled it all with one of our nuggets, but we had to solder it. And I was like, never again. Like, if the breadboard add-on had like a little JST connector so I could plug the NeoPixels in directly, like that would be so cool. So anyway, a little bit of a, a cool hardware win for me this week. Like, I got this new prototype made, and I will share it with all of you and show how it works. I don't, I haven't plugged this in yet. So you notice it's not plugged in. I wasn't brave enough before taking this picture uh, to see if this is like wired wrong and will smoke the sensor by default. So um, if it is, and this uh, sensor is going to die soon, then this is its last known alive picture. Um, so anyway, you got to smoke some electronics in order to, to learn. So speaking of electronics, um, you guys know that I love cool hacking microcontrollers. Um, it's, some, it's one of the my specialties, actually. And um, this is a new um, test board with dual Wi-Fi for the ESP32C5 beta. Um, this is something that I'm very interested in because looking at it from a Wi-Fi hacking perspective, having two radios has all sorts of interesting implications for doing hacking stuff with microcontrollers. So I often talk about um, how microcontrollers are a little bit of a compromise. You know, they don't run a full operating system. So the specs and what they're tuned for tends to be highly specialized. And you either get lucky or you don't. You know, you either for me, like there's some ESP32 microcontrollers that have come out recently that don't have the right combination of features for me. And I just ignore them. You know, they're a miss. Like it, it's just not useful for me. Uh, and then there's some others that are almost perfectly aligned with my use cases, but they have some disadvantages. Like because the company doesn't go all in, they really try to make these useful for as broad uh, a use case as possible. This seems like a bit more of an all in when it comes to Wi Fi stuff. So um, having UART uh, bridge in here, having uh, two uh SMA adapters that allow you well sorry uh like antenna mounts that allow you to have whatever kind of uh oh yeah it is an SMA I'm doubting myself um whatever kind of antenna you want here that means you could have like a highly directional uh antenna that like greatly greatly extends your range and targets a specific area or you could have like a you know really broad like you know kind of just ducky antenna that's like a just a stick that gets broad coverage over a local area you can really mix and match here. This is pretty crazy from uh, a perspective of a potentially like sub $5 chip. So being able to get all this stuff for less than $5 means you like the old game of being like, oh no, you can't attack a device once it moves on to a five gigahertz network with a microcontroller. That could be over very soon. Um, so I'm going to get my hands on these boards and play with them. But from a Wi-Fi hacker's perspective, um, this could be kind of a game-changing thing if it allows you to do some of the some of the really like sexy attacks that have been thus far still restricted to a Raspberry Pi. So we're going to talk about the next evolution of Raspberry Pi um, attacks as we go through the news this week. But I just wanted to uh, shout this out as a really interesting new piece of hardware for people who care about low-cost hacking devices. You can probably expect to see some cool hacker devices being built around this setup if this actually does. Uh, come out. Um, here's a question. Do, the, do they come with monitored mode support slash promiscuous mode? So when working with microcontrollers, you often get a much more low level um, like uh, interface with like the uh, like Wi-Fi and things like that. There are some exceptions where, for example, on the ESP8266 microcontroller, you can only see metadata, which means, you know, you can't read the full packet. You can't do like well, Wi-Fi handshake capturing or anything like that. It's just not possible. Espressif got really paranoid after the ESP8266 and started locking their chips down to prevent malicious behavior. Um, probably to avoid like an import ban or like at least do the bare minimum. So a lot of the research around this is like, you know, reverse engineering their stuff and trying to make versions that do allow you to do like packet injection. They're not as afraid of monitor mode. So that is something that you're usually able to get away with. Um, so if you wanted to do like a listening attack or maybe even grabbing handshakes, that could be possible. Now, there are some things they could bake into the firmware that are really annoying and make it difficult to do. So we're going to have to see whether or not they actually make a substantiated effort to prevent the kinds of creative behavior both you and I are thinking about using this thing for. Um, oh, all right. Phoenix Thunder has to go, guys. I guess we got to shut down the stream. Well, OK, there are 91 of you here. So I guess we'll we'll stick around, but um, we'll see you later. Phoenix Thunder. 
Um, okay, so moving on, we've got some we've got some really crazy stories. Um, so uh, my old manager at Veronis actually uh, published something I thought was really cool. Um, I noticed that as a, the maintainer of a couple of URLs, let's just say, I have uh, some domains as we all do. Um, I saw that a bunch of AI bots were hitting my links. Um, so basically, like I just bought a bunch of like great domains. One of them is my personal domain, which is hack.gay. Um, I know you're probably jealous, but it's basically just a canary token link. And when you go there, I think it goes to like my link, a bunch of like information about like where my my content is. Um, but like it records the IP address and the user agent of everybody that goes to that link. And I look at it and it's just constantly bots, which was um getting really annoying. So um Mike Buckby published a uh, interesting guide that kind of goes over like what these bots are doing and like why you might want to block them and some policies that do that. So I like this. If you want to check it out, I retweeted it. Um, uh, I just thought it was cool because like I am noticing how many different bots are scraping my content and the thought that they're probably doing it to build their AI models and like improve their product is actually annoying. And I would love to just make that like slightly harder or more irritating for them. So thank you to Mike Buckby for that. Um, all right, so uh, th there was an incident where um, it was kind of framed as like this heartwarming, like dog, this dog has prevented bloodshed um, moment, but um, I'm less, I'm less um, optimistic about this. So, uh, you know, I, I read these stories and I try to like read what's being the information that's being presented and then like strip away some of the particulars and see what's really going on here. So at, just analyzing this, um, it seems now that if you cause enough of a disturbance, there is a non-zero chance you will be um, going face to face with a robot dog. Uh, one that looks like this, which I have to say, it is not cute. Um, I, if I was having some sort of like mental breakdown and this thing came around the corner at me, I, I'm going to be completely honest. I might shoot it too. So um, yeah, I, I this um, this story freaks me out because it's kind of presented like a police dog was wounded, but this is like an offensive like uh, dog like like computer robot thing that like crawled up to a man who was freaking out uh, who then shot it. So I just wanted to reframe the narrative here a little bit. Um, so yeah, like so now if you cause enough of a disturbance, like there, like you might find the robot dog come to check in on you and see how your mental health is, or it could be try like I don't know, trying to fight you. I don't know what the policy is. All I'm saying is the news here really freaked me out in framing this as like a hero dog when in fact it is a robot prototype um, that looks super scary. So uh, I don't know what world we're living in anymore sometimes, but the the um, this dog being presented as like a brave little hero um, freaks me out because look at it. It looks like a scary old vacuum cleaner that could crush you if it fell on you. Um, anyway, I am like, I'm not saying I don't like dogs. I like real dogs, but this is not a dog, my friends. This is not even like a Tamagotchi kind of thing. This is like not, this is some Black Mirror stuff. And um, I, out of solidarity with someone who was startled by this thing. I'm just gonna say like, I don't think it's cute. And um, I don't I don't know that this is good. Okay, sorry. I, I'm sorry if any of you are like super pro this particular robot dog. I, I mean, admittedly, it does seem like it's a, a better idea than actually putting like a police officer in there um, and, and in you know, putting a human life at risk. But uh, the robot dog is undeniably scary. That's all I'm saying. All right, so uh, moving on from the robot dog, let's go to the absolute craziest story of the week. Um, so this is Project Ghostbusters. And if you haven't heard about this, then um, I just like, I, all right. I have some of my own personal opinions about Facebook's policies uh, towards data harvesting and uh, whether or not they like really care like what that information is used for. Um, and I've been somewhat vocal about that. So setting that aside, um, undeniably in this case, there is, um, let's look at the actual case itself. There is language here accusing uh, them of violating the wiretapping act in order to gain a competitive advantage against Snapchat. So this is a company that apparently, allegedly, we'll say, was willing to use their recently acquired assets uh, in VPN companies and install root certificates that would allow them to rummage through people's data before it was sent out. So if you were using one of these VPNs or if you enabled um, by default some of these like features that uh, Facebook was advertising, like, oh, try our free VPN, it's integrated, you were actually allowing them to spy on their competitors via like rummaging through all your stuff. Um, 
which sounds crazy, right? Like why would a company that's doing well financially like take that sort of risk? And in fact, um, in the actual, please don't. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, thank you to TechCrunch for not um, putting a gate here. Um, in a direct quote from one of their security people, um, they basically said like, I don't understand how this would ever be okay. Like security people, no matter what kind of consent you get from the general like public would recognize that this is not something that is acceptable and like is not defensible in any way, shape or form. But Facebook, in spite of that, uh, it told them to go forward and uh, announced that we now have the capability to uh, capability to measure detailed in-app in -app activity from parsing Snapchat analytics collected from incentivized participants in uh, on Vado's research program. So like, even though they were paying people to use this VPN and somewhere buried in the terms of service, like there was probably consent to do this, it still went beyond what the average person would be able to suss out from just either reading the terms of service or agreeing to use a free VPN. So if you've ever wondered, like a lot of people ask me like, oh, are free VPN services worth it? And the answer is, um, it depends. Like, do you want do you want like potentially a company rummaging through your traffic in order to like outcompete like another random app on your phone? It's it's just kind of wild to me that like a corporate battle like destroyed uh, users data privacy just to get a little bit of a competitive advantage against, you know, uh, an app that they felt threatened by. Um, so yeah, this was a pretty big deal. A lot of people are talking about this. Obviously, security people are uh, pointing this out as an example of why if you use a free product or if you're incentivized to use a product, some of these users were actually paid to use the product, you might want to dig into the details. And there could be things that you don't necessarily agree to happening when it comes to your data. So um, I don't really recommend free VPNs. I don't think that they are savory. Um, but yeah, as, as um, Cash Control uh, succinctly says, that stuff's whacked. Um, so yeah, uh, please don't use a uh, like v a free VPN by like Meta or like most large. I like you know like Google, I have a Pixel and Google's like oh cool so you want to just do it all under one roof? You want to just use our VPN too? And I was like no that's okay, that's okay. And the trade off is I um, I've been using Mulvad for like a long time and I think I'm gonna switch because after I saw like a train ad for it, I noticed that every time I try to log into anything, I get hit with captchas and so many people are using it for crime um and spam and whatever else that at this point like it's making it's like burning the vpn like their servers are just like almost universally reported for abuse at this point and i have to do a password reset at work every single time i forget to turn it off and i log in so um yeah like it, it's always a struggle finding like a, a vpn that's like a good service that's going to be that balance between like not having to solve endless captchas and also um not accidentally giving your data away to meta to rifle through and it's like corporate quest to defeat snapchat which like barely involves you um so wild um i can't make a specific vpn recommendation um at the moment because nobody is paying me to how about that if i'm gonna sell out it's got to be for a big price but um yeah i'm i Personally, like I wouldn't feel comfortable making a VPN recommendation at this time because um, the one the VPN that I've been using forever is now burned and like I feel like moving on. I'm not saying that like that um, all that is completely cooked. Like it seems to be it seems to be fine for a lot of things, but let's just say it's like no longer low key. And like I like I used to be the only person that uh, in my circle that was using it, and now like I know lots of people that are using it. So it's to me it's at the same stage that like PIA was like right before <laughs> I stopped using it. Um, which is just like getting too big. Um, but who knows, you know, I'm not gonna, whatever, I'm not, I'm not gonna like knock their success. Like I'm just pointing out that for me, it becomes a burden to have to solve captures all the time. And that's how I notice that people are probably doing crime on it is because like it eventually just becomes too burdensome for me to run like a normal Google search. Um, okay, anyway, that's the end of, uh, that's the end of that VPN related rant. Um, but yeah, uh, I agree that that stuff is crazy. So, um, yeah, just be careful, you y'all. Uh, if you're using a VPN, especially if it's a free or cheap or low-cost VPN, there are there is in fact a cost. Wait, I had way more stories than this. Where are they? Oh, they're here. Okay, all right. So let's go through some other crazy news of the week. So if you are running Fedora, like one of my uh, good friends does, uh, you might be crowing about how sophisticated you are and how great Fedora is. Well, guess what? Specifically, Autumn. Uh, Fedora has been the victim of essentially uh, a supply chain attack 
Uh, and actually, it's not just Fedora. I, I'm, I, it says it in the headline, but let's be clear here. This is a tool that is included in a number of different Linux distributions, including Unstable Debian. So um, Unstable Debian is used to build like a bunch of stuff. Uh, so while this is not a, a supply chain attack that affects, for example, like lots of um, like mature or stable versions of operating systems, it was detected. Um, it is pretty spooky. Um, it's currently unknown what this backdoor is designed to do, but it affects SSH authentication. And it potentially means that a, uh, it, it apparently it's been demonstrated that um, a threat actor could gain uh, remote access to just a normal like a uh, version of that operating system, uh, Fedora in this case, um, without any uh, really effort. So uh, again, like it's not totally known what this backdoor trigger is supposed to do aside from uh, affecting the authentication for uh, SSHD. Um, and this is something that is done because uh, XZ Utils uh, had a, oh, no, I don't need a definition, thanks, um, had a supply chain attack uh, and that's really the deciding factor here is if a operating system runs the affected version of XE utils, then um, you've got warnings like this. Stop, please immediately stop usage of any Fedora 41 or Fedora Rawhide instances for work or personal activity. Um, so pretty severe. Uh, so again, if you are one of those bleeding, I love it when my my um, friends are like just in the news. Okay, maybe Will Dorman isn't exactly a friend, but when I was just starting out at Nullbyte, um, I made this ridiculous dot .ru uh, email account uh, and I reached out to him uh, with a question about some article he'd written. And like I'd, re I'd reach out to all these people and everyone saw my, my dot .ru email address and I thought it was really funny, but nobody else did. So nobody would respond. And Will Dorman was the only person that wrote me back. So um, if I remember correctly, and I'll be embarrassed if I'm wrong, uh, Will Dorman is a, like a CERN researcher and he's constantly in the news. And whenever I see him tweeting about something, I know it's about to be like uh, front page news at some point. So yeah, um, anyway, shout out to Will Dorman. Uh, the cool guy at CERN that allowed me to actually get an answer back uh, back when I was a young researcher. Um, I see him on bleep Bleeping Computer along with Patrick Wardle more than like any anyone else. Um, but anyway, yeah, so uh, uh, just be aware that um, some of the unstable versions of these operating systems that use these particular tools with a 10 out of 10 criticality score um, are going to be affected and you're going to want to be very interested in whether or not your operating system does uh, use that particular uh, version. So supply chain attacks are increasingly common and we see them often with PIPEL, uh, which is exactly what we're gonna talk about in the next story. So as a result of all of these uh, supply chain attacks, PIPEL has uh, suspended new user registration. And that is because there is an ongoing automated attack happening that is apparently pretty effective. We've seen a couple different stories of um, supply chain attacks by these sorts of things being compiled and included in projects. So PIPEL has been a major source of malware distribution uh, as a result of these attacks. So um, yeah, uh, if you want <laughs> if you want to uh, join this community, uh, it is currently closed. And that's because they're not able to handle the influx of all these malicious accounts. There's a bunch of account, ta account takeovers. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, started yesterday to upload uh, 365 packages with names that mimic legitimate pack uh, projects. So the way this often works is they will get spammed with all these packages that are um, like typo squatting. So basically they're looking for someone to make like a small error and then take advantage of that to import these this obfuscated code. So basically they, it would mimic a existing package name uh, where maybe there was a, a really common typo. It would have the same obfuscated code um, using, I think it, it was Fortnite. Uh, in order to like make everything impossible or difficult to read. And then it would download additional stagers and other things after it successfully infected um, a build. So that is why we're basically seeing so many of these um, like back like backdoor attacks and some of the other ones we're gonna go through uh, over the course of the rest of the show. Um, it's because of this like pipel attack that we've had a lot of these like long ranging um, supply chain like build attacks. So. Interesting to, to see that PIPEL keeps coming up in the news. And right now, they just have to shut down registration in order to make sure that that um, doesn't continue to happen. OK, yes, thank you. Um, my pronunciation has been corrected. Um, all right, uh, next up, we have Google doing what Google does, uh, shutting down Google Podcast. And this is happening by the end of next week. So 
I don't uh, listen to podcasts, which is ironic since I used to have to do one for, I got to do one for uh, for the show. But um, yeah, um, not much to see here aside from uh, you, Google realizing that YouTube music was becoming much more popular and deciding to uh, shut down another service. So uh, yeah, um, that, that's pretty much all there is for that. All right, next up we have uh, CISA is tagging Microsoft SharePoint remote uh, command injection. A bug is actively exploited. And when you see this uh, actively exploited um, notification from them, it means you're basically out of time. So typically, if these are reported or have limited exploitation, like, you know, they'll pass around the, the order to patch by a certain time. But as soon as this happens, it basically means that it has been automated or a commercial product has been made based on this, or there's a nation state attack that's going on. Um, so yeah, this is just a sign that, uh, it is past the time to, uh, update the CVE. And if we look at the severity, um, okay. Hi. All right. All right. All right. So we've got, an, uh, is that an eight? This is so small. There we go. Okay. So we've got a, we've got a high, um, yeah, an eight. So at, I would say, oh wait, 6.3. All right. All right. So looks like this would need to be used in like a chain. Just trying to like understand a lot of these are, are difficult to get the full measure, but I believe this one, oh yeah, it's chained with a critical privilege escalation flaw for pre-authentication remote code injection. All right. All right. Yeah. So this is a component of a larger attack that is now being actively exploited, uh, in conjunction with others. Anyway, um, so I mentioned that this probably means that the attack has been commercialized. And what I mean by that is that these zero days are often exploited by spyware vendors, and they now make up 50% of the zero days that were exploited in 2023. So uh, that's a kind of frightening trend. Like I've seen for a long time the impact that these spyware vendors and mercenaries have had. Um, both by attacking high profile individuals and getting caught as uh, several companies love to do, uh, but also making more and more dangerous tools and creating an entire industry around incentivizing research into zero days that doesn't lead to any sort of patching. It leaves the vulnerabilities exposed and sells the capabilities uh, to basically whoever has the cash. So seeing that now 50% of zero day vulnerabilities are exploited by mercenaries essentially. Like that represents a pretty thriving cybercrime industry and probably a pretty stark uh, competition to bug bounty programs that are seeking to reward researchers who find these vulnerabilities in the first place. So if you're a researcher now and you have bills, you know, and you're looking to get the most for a zero day vulnerability that you discover, going in through the front door um, isn't always the best financial move anymore. And that's a pretty dramatic shift, or at least it seems like a pretty dramatic shift for how easy it is to get paid now for some of these really secure, uh, uh, some of these really severe zero day vulnerabilities that could affect secure systems. So um, yeah, I continue to really uh, not like these spyware vendors. Like they often uh, are not very reputable and will work with basically anyone who will pay them. So um, them competing against legitimate platforms that are trying to make products better or at least protect their users, um, that is the dynamic tension that has emerged now that seems to be at about 50% when it comes to who is taking advantage of these zero days. All right, so uh, we've talked a little bit about hardware today, and I want to go back to the Raspberry Pi. So the Raspberry Pi was one of the first tools that I used to learn about ethical hacking. And some of the things that were really great about it is most Raspberry Pis have a monitor mode and packet injection supported by default in their included wireless radios. And that's great, because that means I don't need anything else to do some cool hacking stuff. Now, I've seen some hacking boxes set up before that target like Wi-Fi hacking, and some of these would be um, the Wi-Fi pumpkin, for example, uh, would allow you to do like spoofing attacks and basically use it as a like an evil access point. And those were really useful. Uh, but this is a further evolution where now there is a $700 um, cybercrime uh, enabling Geobox tool that runs on the Raspberry Pi that allows you to like control some of the things that you might pay a larger subscription for otherwise, or that might be kind of like, you know, the most dangerous or risky part of the operation. So if you are using a geo box um, and you're able to like implant this somewhere and have a network connection that acts as a proxy, you could then connect this to a number of different VPN tools, proxy tools. Um, you could potentially spoof GPS locations if you need to do a particular type of crime that requires you to be in uh, an exact area. Um, 
this tool can really do a lot. Like just looking at the suite of software that it offers, it has a lot of internet, middle box, proxy, and VPN services that let you hide where you're actually like committing the crimes from. And it makes it really difficult for investigators to conduct forensic investigations because it can simulate a lot of environments and it can also route traffic in ways that are very confusing to follow as well as spoofing some interesting things. So as an evil access point, it seems to um, function as that, but it seems to be mostly focused around financial crime and providing um, services that you need to like defeat 2FA, services that you would need in order to anonymize your attacks or connections, and other things that would make it really difficult for investigators to track you down. So using a basically disposable device like a Raspberry Pi for this sort of thing is an interesting model. <clears throat> you basically uh, bring the hardware and they bring the software that enables the crime. So this is like um, cybercrime affiliate like stuff like brought down to the like Raspberry Pi level essentially. So like instead of like, you know, renting out like their servers and infrastructure, you know, you just bring your own Raspberry Pi, plug it into whatever you have access to and then like have the ability to run or configure your own services. So this is certainly possible. Um, there's probably going to be a lot of hot Raspberry Pis hidden inside of dusty electronics, like connected to some like Ethernet port in like an advertisement somewhere. Um, there's so many like um, connected like signs and stuff like that I've been seeing in Los Angeles that probably have some sort of data connection that I'm sure someone might plug one of these Raspberry Pis into and have like a weird proxy server that's attacking stuff. Who knows? Like. It just means that, uh, okay, I'm not I'm not going to say you can get a Raspberry Pi for $35. That is absolutely not true anymore. I don't know when this article was written, but um, Bill, you you know that Raspberry Pis don't cost $35 anymore. Well, maybe you've got a better source than me. Never mind. Bill's a journalist, I'm, and I'm just reading his story here, so I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to dispute his sources. But I will say that for about $60 on Amazon right now, you could get a Raspberry Pi and potentially you know, start running some of these malicious services. Although I will note that um, the kinds of people that provide these services are notorious for backdoors and exit schemes. So um, they're not necessarily known for their customer service. They are, however, known for getting prosecuted and, um, you know, like providing um, information to prosecutors as well as stealing money when they feel threatened. So um, yeah, uh, uh, that's going to be one at your own risk. Okay, next up. Oh, this is an interesting one. So I've been um, always taking a look at like AI attacks. And this is one that uh, is pretty straightforward and not super sophisticated, but definitely deserves to be mentioned. So this is um, the Ray for framework. And the Ray framework is basically um, an open source AI framework that is supposed to distribute computing power so that people can run like large um, like AI model tasks and things like that. It's designed for like research institutions and like other businesses that are trying to distribute the workload to be able to do that in a way that makes sense uh, and is easy to set up and do. Uh, apparently, there is a vulnerability in this that is allowing people to basically steal computing power. So connect to these networks and then um, do things like cryptocurrency mining, as one would expect. Like once you, you know, you leave something open, it provides computing power. 90% reliability, somebody is going to um, attempt to mine cryptocurrency, or at least that's kind of what I've seen. Sorry, I just realized the computer's about to die. All right, there we go. So um, yeah, like not like this isn't as spicy as like the malicious AI models that were being uploaded in some of the previous uh, cases I've seen, but it is interesting to note that sometimes like the investment in infrastructure to make sure that AI tools can be run effectively and to make sure that they scale and have the right computing power. Um, if some of these underlying open source projects are compromised, then it turns out um, you could just steal a ton of computing power and use it to do basically whatever you want. So yeah, again, uh, it seems like the the number one thing that happens when somebody finds this and like you know they're initially exploiting it is they just mine a bunch of cryptocurrency. And yes, exactly, um, that is a bunch of. Um, cryptocurrency miners uh, running on a compromised server. So you can expect that these attacks are often um, detected when the computing power just absolutely spikes and then they get shut down relatively quickly. And it looks like that's what happened here. But uh, still, yeah, like the the raw computing power necessary to uh, you know like run all these AI tools is pretty immense. And being able to hijack it could lead to attacks that are a little bit more sophisticated, <clears throat> sophisticated and organized 
than just running a cryptocurrency miner. Like running a cryptocurrency miner is the harbinger of like something like way worse, like always. Cause it's always like the first wave is the crypto miner. And then the second wave is some sort of like crazy surveillance bot or something. So uh, we'll see what happens next, but uh, you can expect to see these infrastructure networks that have been set up for AI uh, tools to be targeted as a very, very rich source of compute power uh, in the future. All right. Speaking of um, speaking of uh, infecting a bunch of, uh, uh, I guess, just compromised devices, we have Asus routers being exploited over the course of 72 hours to create more the moon um, proxy endpoints. So the idea of this service is uh, it goes after a bunch of devices that are compromised. It creates the, a node uh, out of them, and then it allows people who are doing cybercrime, fraud, and a bunch of other stuff to uh, connect to it and use those endpoints to push their malicious traffic. So if you're doing a bunch of carding, if you are that person that keeps buying stuff from my online store and gets a bunch of fraud alerts because you're going through like a, a scary VPN or like a weird endpoint that doesn't make sense, um, that's basically what I'm talking about. It's like people that are attempting to commit fraud uh, because they have a bunch of cards they got online or paid for and then are attempting to make a purchase. Um, often these purchases then uh, have chargebacks and whatever, and it's a huge pain. So I've had to learn about this just because like I occasionally sell stuff online and I get fraud warnings like all the time. And this is like the worst part. Like while a lot of these domains or a lot of these other uh, places that are typically used by people that are committing fraud can be burned pretty quickly, like my favorite VPN service, um, it it still means that people are able to buy access to these sorts of devices that don't have a blacklist yet. Um, they're recently exploited and they don't have any history of pushing malicious, malicious traffic. So they can be used for some of these really risky behaviors. And as long as the botnet keeps growing, then it can keep providing the service. So um, really interesting that uh, there's somebody who their entire income stream is just the faceless proxy service, which connects to compromised devices and pushes content out of those gateways. So if you're wondering about like, you know, black market VPNs and like how they're created and, and how these sorts of services get started. Yeah, it's just like exploits and people getting to these zero days first or maybe second in some cases, I don't think they really care uh, and taking over routers to use their uh, compute power and routing ability to build these proxies. Um, it's really interesting, frankly. Um, but yeah, that's why it's so difficult for uh, <clears throat> that's why it's so difficult for people who are running like a store or something like that to be able to detect when someone is using a stolen credit card number. Because provided you can get a proxy that's roughly close to where the user would be ordering from, if you have that information, like it's almost impossible for somebody to be able to detect a fraudulent claim um, if it's going through a network like this. So big impact for people that have to like process card transactions or things like that. It's it's a uh, um, yeah, difficult thing to deal with. And now you can see a little bit about how those sorts of networks are created. Oh my gosh. So my home state in the news, um, a Montanite, uh, decided to become a robocall terrorist, um, and called a bunch of people with disturbing, threatening, and often bizarre messages over the course of several years. Um, the court issued a 9 million, almost $10 million pa penalty and um, this was um, repeated harassment of communities that had recently suffered tragedies where this guy would basically target a community that had some sort of um, tragedy, like a shooting or something like that, and spam residents with obscene calls, like some of them talking about really bizarre like conspiracy theories. So uh, this person was operating out of the first town I ever lived in when I moved here, um, and uh, apparently... Uh, would not stop. So in spite of being contacted numerous times and having other fines and fees levied against him, he continued to do this. And um, the call spoofing made it really difficult for people to initially find out who was doing this. And he was making it look like other phone numbers were actually doing the calls. So if you um, got one of these bizarre calls, um, there was a lot of people who got them. And apparently they were really, really um, upsetting. And a lot of people immediately called the police. Uh, and that's what kind of began the investigation was how visible these were. Um, but yeah, he was using automated dialer software to uh, pre-record messages and um, send them to entire communities and uh, yeah, would not stop. So um, I always kind of cringe when I see my state in the news lately, but uh, moving on, moving on. So we talked about um, some of these supply chain attacks earlier, and one of those victims appears to be the top.gg um, Discord bot community. Um, 
with uh, which has 170,000 members. But as one of those members vehemently told me before the stream, um, they claim that only a couple hundred people were impacted. Um, so this is malware that steals sensitive information and is typically going up to Discord um, tokens and things like that and appears to be linked to the Python package um, squatting that we were talking about before. So this is either accounts being taken over and then being used to push malicious packages uh, with up well, or pushing malicious updates to packages or creating other packages that are very similar and taking advantage, advantage of typos to insert malicious backdoors. So yeah, um, this is something that we've been talking about all week, like just because uh, they've been having a hard time over at, um, at uh, people, people, whatever, sorry. I've, whoever corrected the way I said that, uh, I apologize. But uh, yes, um, this is uh, becoming kind of a problem. Um, and you can see that the attack pattern here, again, is basically um, picking popular plat uh, like uh, projects and then creating a bunch of similar looking names that will infect anybody that accidentally imports them. Really difficult to identify these as well because like often they'll include the original code that they're copying and then also some malicious code. So the import will behave as normal and you won't get any errors because it is successfully importing something. So um, yeah, really, really difficult to be able to detect some of these attacks because if they are done well, um, it makes it easy for attackers to insert something into a build that then gets distributed to many other places. A uh, new MFA bypassing kits. Uh, what's the name? Um, uh, a Tycoon 2FA is targeting Microsoft 365 and Gmail accounts to bypass two-factor authentication. So 2FA is now enough of a thing that most of these kits are attempting to bypass, or at least assuming that 2FA is enabled. The number one thing you can do to avoid these sorts of services is to have a physical authentication key, which is such a pain in the ass. As someone who has one and uses it, I will say, having it with me all the time. I basically had to buy six of them and like uh, distribute them in a couple places that I have access to so that I know I'm never caught without them. But every once in a while, I have to uh, authenticate. And another recommendation here is if you're particularly concerned, which I was at the time, you can enroll in Google's Advanced Protection Program. Um, but Google's Advanced Protection Program is exceptionally um, protected. Like I have a hard time connecting to my router sometimes and like logging in because it won't let me send credentials over HTTP. So let, let that one sink in. It's a, it's a little, it's a little much. Um, but you really super can't get into your account without a physical security key if you enable, uh, advanced, uh, protection. So just be aware of that. Um, there, there are some things that will make you a bit more resilient to these sorts of attacks that anticipate 2FA. Um, but just be careful and make sure that 2FA isn't like your only, only, only thing uh, that is preventing someone from logging into an incredibly important account. All right, almost through it. Um, so this doesn't surprise me at all. When you search for things using, you know, like a, just a typical Google, Google search, you are going to see sponsored results up at the top. And those sponsored results are frequently um, scams. They will be fake download pages for whatever you just searched for or other things that are designed to get you to download all sorts of unwanted stuff. Some of them are viruses, some of them are just unwanted adware, and some of them are full on like um, computer repair scams where they make you think that your computer's infected and then have you pay them to quote, remove the malware, even though there's nothing there. So um, we've all seen these, but it was only a matter of time uh, before people started realizing that these new AI suggested results could be done in the same way because you know there's a profit here at stake and you can put advertised results into this, uh, it makes financial sense for people who want to distribute their malware to uh, target these ad campaigns towards AI search results. So just like any other search result, these sorts of conversational searches are now yielding potentially malicious results, uh, but are they're doing it with increased confidence. So rather than just giving you a list and having you sort through it, they are now making recommendations and those recommendations can be malicious. So this article is kind of making the point that uh, if you are having a conversation with your like AI assistant and it recommends something uh, that's malicious, it's a little bit different from going through and like noticing that the first or second you know like uh, links look a little funky. If they're just giving you like you know one recommended result and it happens to be malicious, um, 
that's not good. Uh, I feel like people have a higher chance of going to these than they might have if there wasn't any sort of recommendation behind it. So the concern here is that people will ask a question, get a recommendation, and then take that recommendation more seriously, even though it's it's actually a malicious link. So we're already seeing um, that these AI tools are delivering potentially malicious or unwanted scams. And that's a pretty big concern as these are rolling out and people are putting more and more faith in the processing that's going on behind those recommendations. All right. And I think this is the last one we have. Oh, this is just, sorry, this is just from that story earlier. This is the actual court document, if you guys are interested in reading it, that is accusing Facebook of um, wiretapping in order to go after Snapchat. Again, like an uh, unbelievable story here in how far Facebook is willing to go, um, undermining VPN privacy and basically like adding their own certificates to be able to get a competitive advantage against another company. Like arguably illegal according to this um, this uh, like filing. So I guess we'll see whether or not anything actually comes from this. But the unsealing of this um, raises, at least in my head, some pretty serious like questions about how dedicated Facebook is to their users' privacy. If they're willing to just rummage through your stuff just to get a peek at one of their rivals, that fight doesn't even involve you. You know, like having them like throw your data privacy to the wind and just assume that they should go in there and start like looking at that stuff is a pretty wild move to me. And I think that their own security person said it best when they said that there's not really a scenario where that's okay. So um, yeah, uh, that's the news for this week. Uh, we had a really good conversation, as I mentioned, with the incident of the, of the month researcher. This time it's Joe uh, talking about the craziest stuff they've seen this month and the way that adversaries are actually attacking real customers and then also what it's like to do adversary simulation. So being able to emulate what attackers are doing, turn around and show off what that capability looks like and prepare customers for that was a pretty cool conversation. So if you haven't checked it out, make sure to check out that conversation. And also we'll be doing some cutouts from that and publishing them in the next week or so. I am going to be back on Wednesday uh, for the next Q&A stream. So if you're one of the, wow, 147 people on the stream that has uh, potentially asked a question um, and that I haven't gotten around to, then make sure to join us on the Wednesday stream. At the same time, we'll be taking all of your questions and hopefully I will have a successful version, which this one, of this guy that's going to do a ducky script from at least two miles away, That a ducky script attack. So you know, it's going to be a bad USB attack and I'm going to be using this Adafruit library, but making this prototype work is going to be my goal for the next stream. So expect to um, see me attempt to break some distance records for a Rick roll. I don't think I'll get it, but I think that somebody's probably done a Rick roll to the moon or uh, even further. So I, maybe I should temper my expectations, but we'll see. Anyway, if you are a fan of the stream and you want us to keep going, then you can easily support us by going to the link this week, which is, as always, veronis.com slash Cody. That's K-O-D-Y. Veronis is a sponsor of the stream and lets me do this with my own editorial content. Every week, I get to make the decisions about what we talk about, which is so incredibly cool because I get to follow the stuff that you guys are interested in, and I get to make sure that we're talking about the freshest, most interesting, and uh, like kind of unrestricted stuff in the hacking community. So that's why I like this show so much. If you want to support us, go to veronis.com slash Cody. It lets them know you anticipate, you, sorry, you enjoy the stream and you're anticipating the next one. So uh, we can keep doing it every week, twice a week. So I will see all of you on Wednesday. I'm going to be um, traveling this weekend for our friend's birthday. So uh, I will see all of you back on Wednesday, hopefully with some cool questions. And um, the, wherever Killian is, I hope he has a good weekend too. All right. Goodbye, everyone. I will see you next week.